Chapter 4 of The Ghost, A Modern Fantasy by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Ellers. Chapter 4. Rosa's Summons. Everyone knows the gold rooms of the Grand Babylon on the embankment. They are immense, splendid and gorgeous. They possess more gold leaf to the square inch than any music hall in London. They were designed to throw the best possible light on humanity in the mass, to illuminate effectively not only the shoulders of women, but also the somberness of men's attire. Not a tint on their walls that has not been profoundly studied and mixed and laid with a view to the great aim. Wherefore, when the electric clusters glow in the ceiling and the after-dinner band, that unique corporation of British citizens disguised as wild Hungarians, breathes and pants out its after-dinner melodies from the raised platform in the main salon. People regard this coup d'oeil with awe and feel glad that they are in the dazzling picture, and even the failures who are there imagine that they have succeeded. Wherefore, also, the gold rooms of the Grand Babylon are expensive, and only philanthropic societies, plutocrats, and the titans of the theatrical world may persuade themselves that they can afford to engage them. It was very late when I arrived at my cousin Sullivan's much-advertised reception. I had wished not to go at all, simply because I was inexperienced and nervous. But both he and his wife were so good-natured and so obviously anxious to be friendly that I felt bound to appear, if only for a short time. As I stood in the first room, looking vaguely about me at the lively throng of resplendent actresses, who chattered and smiled so industriously and with such abundance of gesture to the male acquaintances who surrounded them, I said to myself that I was singularly out of place there. I didn't know a soul, and the stream of arrivals having ceased, neither Sullivan nor Emmeline was immediately visible. The moving picture was at once attractive and repellent to me. It became instantly apparent that the majority of the men and women there had but a single interest in life, that of centering attention upon themselves, and their various methods of reaching this desirable end were curious and wonderful in the extreme. For all practical purposes, they were still on the boards which they had left but an hour or two before. It seemed as if they regarded the very orchestra in the light of a specially contrived accompaniment to their several actions and movements. As they glanced carelessly at me, I felt that they held me as a foreigner, as one outside that incredible little world of theirs which they call the profession. And so I felt crushed, with a faint resemblance to a worm. You see, I was young. I walked through towards the main salon, and in the doorway between the two rooms I met a girl of striking appearance who was followed by two others. I knew her face very well, having seen it often in photograph shops. It was the face of Marie Deschamps the popular divette of the Diana Theatre, the leading lady of Sullivan's long-lived musical comedy, My Queen. I needed no second glance to convince me that Miss Deschamps was a very important personage indeed, and further, that a large proportion of her salary of £75 a week was expended in the suits and trappings of triumph. If her dress did not prove that she was on the topmost bar of the tree, then nothing could. Though that night is still recent history, Times have changed. Divets could do more with 300 a month for then than they can with 800 now. As we passed, she examined me with a curiosity whose charm was its frankness. Of course, she put me out of countenance, particularly when she put her hand on my sleeve. Divets have the right to do these things. I know who you are, she said, laughing and showing her teeth. You are dear old Sully's cousin. He pointed you out to me the other night when you were at the Diana. Now don't say you aren't, or I shall look such a fool, and for goodness sake don't say you don't know me, because everyone knows me, and if they don't, they ought to. I was swept away by the exuberance of her attack, and, blushing violently, I took the small hand which she offered, and assured her that I was in fact Sullivan Smith's cousin and her sincere admirer. That's all right, she said, raising her superb shoulders after a special manner of her own. Now you shall take me to Sullivan, and he shall introduce us. Any friend of dear old Sully's is a friend of mine. How do you like my new song? What new song? I inquired incautiously. Why, who milked the cow, of course. 
I endeavoured to give her to understand that it had made an indelible impression on me, and with such like converse we went in search of Sullivan, while every one turned to observe the unknown, shy young man who was escorting Marie Deschamps. Here he is, my companion said at length, as we neared the orchestra, listening to the band. He should have a band, the little dear. Sullivan, introduce me to your cousin. Charmed, delighted, and Sullivan beamed with pleasure. Ah, my young friend, he went on to me, you know your way about fairly well. But they're medical students, they're all alike. Well, what do you think of the show? Hasn't he done it awfully well, Mr. Foster? said Miss Deschamps. I said that I should rather think he had. Look here, said Sullivan, becoming grave and dropping his voice. There are four hundred invitations, and it'll cost me seven hundred and fifty pounds. But it pays. You know that, don't you, Marie? Look at the advertisement. And I've got a lot of newspaper chaps here. It'll be in every paper tomorrow. I reckon I've done this thing on the right lines. It's only a reception, of course. But let me tell you, I've seen after the refreshments. Not snacks, refreshments, mind you. And there's a smoke room for the boys, and the wife's got a spiritualism room, and there's the show in this room. Some jolly good people here, too. Not all chorus girls and walking gents, are they, Marie? You bet not, the lady replied. Rosetta Rosa's coming, and she won't go quite everywhere. Not quite. By the way, it's about time she did come. He looked at his watch. Ah, Mr. Foster, the divet said, you must tell me all about that business. I'm told you were there, and that there was a terrible scene. What business? I inquired. At the opera the other night, when Alresca broke his thigh. Didn't you go behind and save his life? I didn't precisely save his life, but I attended to him. They say he is secretly married to Rosa. Is that so? I really can't say, but I think not. What did she say to him when she went into his dressing room? I know all about it, because one of our girls has a sister who's in the opera chorus, and her sister saw Rosa go in. I do not want to know what she said, and what he said. An impulse seized me to invent a harmless little tale for the diversion of Marie Deschamps. I was astonished at my own enterprise. I perceived that I was getting accustomed to the society of greatness. Really? she exclaimed when I had finished. I assure you. He's teasing, Sullivan said. Mr. Foster wouldn't do such a thing, she observed, drawing herself up, and I bowed. A man with an eyeglass came and began to talk confidently in Sullivan's ear, and Sullivan had to leave us. See you later, he smiled. Keep him out of mischief, Marie. And I say, Carl, the wife said I was to tell you particularly to go into her crystal gazing room. Don't forget. I'll go too, Miss Deschamps said. You may take me there now, if you please. And then I must go down to where the champagne is flowing. But not with you, not with you, Mr. Foster. There are other gentlemen here very anxious for the post. Now come along. We made our way out of the stir and noise of the Grand Salon. Marie Deschamps leaning on my arm in the most friendly and confiding way in the world. And presently we found ourselves in a much smaller apartment, crowded with whispering seekers after knowledge of the future. This room was dimly lighted from the ceiling by a single electric light, whose shade was a queer red Japanese lantern. At the other end of it were double curtains. These opened just as we entered, and Emmeline appeared, leading by the hand a man who was laughing nervously. "'Your fortune, ladies and gentlemen, your fortune!' she cried pleasantly. Then she recognised me, and her manner changed, or I fancied it did. "'Ah, Carl, so you've arrived!' she exclaimed, coming forward and ignoring all her visitors except Marie and myself. "'Yes, Emmeline, dear,' said Marie, "'we've come. And please, I want to see something in the crystal. How do you do it?' Emmeline glanced around. "'Sullivan said my crystal-gazing would be a failure,' she smiled. But it isn't, is it? I came in here as soon as I had done receiving, and I've already had I don't know how many clients. I shan't be able to stop long, you know. The fact is, Sullivan doesn't like me being here at all. He thinks it's not right of the hostess. But it's perfectly charming of you, someone put in. Perfectly delicious, said Marie. Now, who shall I take first? Emmeline asked, puzzled. Oh, me, of course, Marie de Chon replied without a hesitation or a doubt, that she and I had come in last, and the others acquiesced, because Marie was on the topmost bow of all. Come along, then, said Emmeline, relieved. 
I made as if to follow them. No, Mr. Foster, said Marie, you just stay here and don't listen. The two women disappeared behind the portiere, and a faint giggle, soon suppressed, came through the portiere from Marie. I obeyed her orders, but as I had not the advantage of knowing a single person in that outer room, I took myself off for a stroll in the hope of encountering Rosetta Rosa. Yes, certainly in the hope of encountering Rosetta Rosa. But in none of the thronged chambers did I discover her. When I came back, the waiting room for prospective crystal gazers was empty, and Emmeline herself was just leaving it. What, I exclaimed all over. Yes, she said, Sullivan has sent for me. You see, of course, one has to mingle with one's guests. Only they're really Sullivan's guests. And what about me, I said. Am I not going to have a look into the crystal? I had, as a matter of fact, not the slightest interest in her crystal at that instant. I regarded the crystal as a harmless distraction of hers, and I was being simply jocular when I made that remark. Emmeline, however, took it seriously. As her face had changed when she first saw me in the box at the opera, and again tonight when she met me and Marie de Chon on my arm, so once more it changed now. Do you really want to? she questioned me in her thrilling voice. My soul said, it's all rubbish, but suppose there is something in it after all. And I said aloud, yes, come then. We passed through the room with the red Japanese lantern, and lo, the next room was perfectly dark, save for an oval of white light, which fell slantingly on a black marble table. The effect was rather disconcerting at first, but the explanation was entirely simple. The light came from an electric table lamp, with a black cardboard shade arranged at an angle which stood on the table. As my eyes grew accustomed to the obscurity, I discovered two chairs. Sit down, said Emily, and she and I each took one of the chairs at opposite sides of the table. Emily was magnificently attired. As I looked at her in the dimness across the table, she drummed her fingers on the marble, and then she bent her face to glance within the shade of the lamp, and for a second her long and heavy yet handsome features were displayed to the minutest part in the blinding ray of the lamp, and the next second they were in obscurity again. It was uncanny. I was impressed, and all the superstition which, like a snake, lies hidden in the heart of every man, stirred vaguely and raised its head. Carl, Emmeline began and paused. The woman, indubitably, did affect me strangely. Hers was a lonely soul, an unusual mixture of the absolutely conventional and of something quite else, something bizarre, disturbing and inexplicable. I was conscious of a feeling of sympathy for her. Well, I murmured, do you believe in the supernatural? I neither believe nor disbelieve, I replied, for I have never met with anything that might be a manifestation of it. But I may say that I am not a hard and fast materialist. And I added, do you believe in it? Of course, she snapped. Then if you really believe if it's so serious to you, why do you make a show of it for triflers? Ah, she breathed, some of them do make me angry. They like to play at having dealings with the supernatural. But I thought the crystal would be such a good thing for Sullivan's reception. It is very important to Sullivan that this should be a great success, our first large public reception, you know. Sullivan says we must advertise ourselves. The explanation of her motives was given so naively, so simply and unaffectedly, that it was impossible to take exception to it. Where's the crystal? I inquired. It is here, she said, and she rolled a glass ball with the suddenness that of the appearance of magic from the dark portion of the table's surface into the oval of light. And it was so exactly spherical, and the tabletop was so smooth, that it would not stay where it was put, and she had to hold it there with her ringed hand. So that's it, I remarked. Carl, she said, it is any right I should warn you. Some weeks ago I saw in the crystal the face of a man whom I did not know. I saw it again and again, and always the same scene. Then I saw you at the opera last week, and Sullivan introduced you as his cousin that he talks about sometimes. 
Did you notice that night that I behaved rather queerly? Yes, I spoke shortly. You are the man whom I saw in the crystal. Really? I ejaculated, smiling, or at least trying to smile. And what is the scene of which I am part? You are standing... But no. She abruptly ceased speaking and coughed, clearing her throat, and she fixed her large eyes on me. Outside I could hear the distant strain of the orchestra and the various noises of a great crowd of people. But this little dark room, with its sharply defined oval of light, was utterly shut off from the scene of gaiety. I was aware of an involuntary shudder, and for the life of me I could not keep my gaze steadily on the face of the tall woman who sat so still with such impressiveness on the other side of the table. I waited for her to proceed, and after what seemed a long interval she spoke again. "'You aren't afraid, are you?' she demanded. "'Of course I'm not.' Then you shall look into the crystal and try to see what I saw. I will not tell you. You shall try to see for yourself. You may succeed if I help you. Now try to free your mind from every thought, and look, earnestly, look. I drew the globe towards me from under her fingers. Rum, I murmured to myself. Then I strenuously fixed my eyes on the glinting depths of the crystal, full of strange shooting fires, but I could see nothing whatever. No go, I said. You'll have to tell me what you saw. Patience, there is time yet. Look again. Take my hand in your right hand. I obeyed, and we sat together in the tense silence. After a few minutes, the crystal darkened and then slowly cleared. I trembled with an uneasy anticipation. You see something? She breathed sorrowfully in my ear. Not yet, not yet, I whispered, but it is coming. Yes, I see myself and a, and a woman, a, a very pretty woman. I am clasping her hand. Don't you recognise the woman? Again, Emmeline's voice vibrated like a lamentation in my ear. I did recognise the woman, and the sweat stood on my brow. It, it is Rosetta Rosa. And what else do you see? My questioner pursued remorselessly. I, I, I see a figure behind us, I stammered. But what figure I cannot make out. It is threatening me. It is threatening me. It's a horrible thing. It will kill me. Ah! I jumped up with a nervous movement. The crystal, left to itself, rolled off the table to the floor and fell with a thud unbroken on the soft carpet. And I could hear the intake of Emmeline's breath. At that moment, the double portiere was pulled apart, and someone stood there in the red light from the Japanese lantern. "'Is Mr. Foster here? I want him to come with me,' said a voice. And it was the voice of Rosa. Just behind her was Sullivan. "'I expected you'd be here,' laughed Sullivan. End of chapter 4